Good evening, Good evening. And, and welcome once again to the Literary Hour. I'm your host, Jackie Sae, and with me tonight is my co-host, Dennis Cha, because uh, Professor K. Moses Nangba is unable to join us tonight. And today we have a special treat for you. Dennis and I have our professor here with us. Our professor who many call the poet laureate of Liberia. Professor Patricia Jabe Wesley, welcome professor. Thank you, thank you very much. And before I start, there may be some of you Liberians, I don't know who, who may not know Dr. Jabe Wesley. So I'm going to read her bio to acquaint you with her and then we'll start. And I want you to listen carefully as uh, Professor Jabe Wesley um, discussed with us Liberia, the world, the human condition, the human experience, and all things in between. And so I will read her bio now. Dr. Patricia Jabe Wesley, a Liberian Civil War survivor and poet, immigrated with her family to the US during the Liberian Civil War. Her books of poetry have been critically reviewed by literary critics and scholars in Europe, Africa, South America, America, and elsewhere. A regular interviewee on her poetics by NPR affiliate TV and radio stations around the US, Dr. Jabba Wesley is also a public speaker on topics about the Liberian Civil War, the plight of women, and African and African diasporic poets. She is the author of six books of poetry, and I have them, and a children's um, book, including Praise Song for My Children, New and Selected Poems, When the Wanderers Come Home, Where the Road Turns, The River is Rising, Becoming Ebony, and Before the Palms Could Bloom, Poems of Africa. There is a theme here, and we will explore that as well. Professor Jabba Wesley's individual poems and nonfiction articles have been published in numerous magazines, including the Harvard Review, the Harvard Divinity Review, Transition Magazine, Prairie Schooner, Crab Orchard Review, New Orleans Review, Black Renaissance Noir, among others. Her poetry and nonfiction pieces have been anthologized in dozens of books in the United States and across the world. And her work has been translated in Spanish, Finnish, and Hebrew. She is professor of English, creative writing, and African literature at Penn State University's Altoona campus. And again, we say welcome, Professor. Thank you very much, Daki and Dennis. And we say welcome, uh, back to Professor Patricia Jabe Wesley. We are honored to have you, by the way. Uh, as uh, Jackie mentioned, this is our professor. She taught me English literature in high school and taught Jackie in college. And so we are happy to have you. We want to welcome all our viewers from across the globe to our literary hour. And our topic for the day is poetry and writing. Of course, we're talking to a poet. Back to you, Jackie. Yes, and, and Prof, I would like to say that there are many of your students watching, uh, I, I, and Aaron said, I remember her. So so people are, are watching. So let's get right into it. Uh, Professor, before we begin, we have to begin at the beginning. So tell us a little bit of how you got started in poetry writing or in writing before I tell them about my class struggles with you. <laughs> I think Dennis had a worse time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I started, I think I was a storyteller from a long time ago. And I think I got it from my mom. I'm trying to correct history because people think, you know, because my father was smart when he was in college and high school, and my mom never got a chance to go far, they always think I was like my father, but a storyteller was my mother and her family. And they are the orat orators, and I can see it in my brothers and in my, and my uncles, you know, when they were living. I started telling stories, and um, I think as a child. Well, I remember as a child in a village, I spent three years in my home village. 
okay, when my father sent me there. And my grandfather was very old by the time I went there in a past the mid as a little girl and on boarding school and spending most of my time with my uncles. And my father, my uncle used to, my grandfather used to always say things like, and he never thought he got a story until I had told my version. And <laughs> and, and he would tell me to tell a story after every, all my courses has talked. And he would say, no, no, I want her to tell a story. And I would be telling a story and my, my cousins would say, in Grable, you know, that's not true. She's adding to it. <laughs> <laughs> and my grandfather used to say, you were no book and you write books. I like the way you told your story because I would tell it in details like we're walking to the to the stream and then he was kicking the rock and the birds were passing and you know I would just put everything in it, you know, all the details. Mm -hmm. And then I came to my father's house and my father got custody of me between the age of 13. And so I was living there and and I used to write. I used to find time, write, like we used to do a lot of work. Uh, my stepmother was tough. And so in the night when they were all sleeping, I would start writing. I would write story. Like between two and six o'clock in the morning, I'm writing. And sometimes my father would come to the room to turn the light on off and he would see me writing. And he would say, What are you doing? I'm like, I'm writing, I'm writing something. And I, I was writing stories. And then my father gave me his um, old England in literature book because he thought I needed to read more about literature. That was literature both from the 50s from the time he was in college it was a big red book england in literature and i started reading the poems by john Donne, elizabeth barrett browning and you know Shaw. So i started reading these people and i love their work and i love their poetry and i also was reading a lot of the psalms i used to like the psalms because there was poetry and so one day I thought, okay, I'm gonna be a poet. So I, I, I spent a lot of time writing out some poems from Don, from all those writers I like, their poetry. I wrote, I plagiarized the poems and on every page I wrote by Patricia Dabbitt. And then <laughs> when he came, I bound it, stapled it with a stapling machine, because we had a lot of things around the house. And I stapled it and I put, poems by Patricia Javit. And then when my father came from work and I set his table and while he was eating, I told him I had just published a book of poems. <laughs> and, and then he said, and I was like 13. And he said, oh, I'm so interested. Let me see it. So he, so he saw it, he still can read. So I read the first poem. <laughs> <laughs> I read his second poem. My father stopped eating. You know, he was <laughs> My father was a disciplinary. He said, you sure you wrote those poems? And I said, yes. And he said, you sure you wrote them? And I said, <laughs> yes. He said, if you say yes, the third time I'll whip you. Those poems are British poems. <laughs> They're poems by British authors, not you. And then I said, did you copy them from the book? I said, yes. Then he said, that's not how you become a poet. He said, but you will be a poet today. <laughs> <laughs> he said, if you get, get, sit in that corner, he, he gave me a pad. He said, if you don't write a poem today, I will whip you for it. You know the African father. I mm -hmm. said, he said, you can do better than them. If they can write that, you can write it better. So I started writing. I sat in the corner and I wrote a poem. And then I read it to my father and and he said, you are a writer. You can be a writer. So I, then I was writing now and knowing that I couldn't plagiarize, writing my own work. And when, by the time I was 14, I would write up to my fingers. I right, read short stories and poems with him, no typewriter. So my father one day came home from work and he brought a big new electric typewriter in the box. He took it out of the box, he set me on the table, and he brought a great tapping book. And he said, Madam, I said, yeah, and when you ready to call me, Madam. And he said, you see this thing? You got one month to learn how to type. I said, where's the teacher? <laughs> <laughs> he said, you are the teacher. You will teach yourself how to type. He said, look at my fingers. Put your fingers here, A-S-D-F, A-S-D-F. He said, if you follow each book and each 
section you will know how to type in one month. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, this man is crazy. And I can't argue with him, so I, you can't argue, nobody could argue with my father. So he he said, in one month, I will test you. I said, what? And he said, if you don't know it, you will know I will punish you. So I spent time in one month, I knew how to type. I knew how to type fast, but I didn't know how to type numbers. And so when he called me in a month, exactly a month, he said, I'm ready for the test. And then he went to the page and I said, I don't know how to type numbers yet. He said, did you say you want to be a writer? I said, yeah. He said, you don't want to be a mathematician. You don't need numbers. <laughs> so that's how I learned how to type. Never learn how to do numbers. When I get to numbers, I have to look at it type better. And that was the end. And I, that's when I started writing. And I wrote, I wrote from that year. I went to high school. I wrote for my the Paxes tech writing at CWA. I wrote stories. I wrote poems to the paper. And every, every when they when they publish the paper, every time the other girls I knew would be the most beautiful girls, the most popular, the most sociable, the this girl. And I was always the best poet or the best writer. That all I was. <laughs> so that's how I started writing. Yeah, it's um, li listening to you. Uh, 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 remind rem reminds me of the um, quote by Ernest Hemingway. And somebody asked him, um, "How do you be a write? How how do you become a writer?" And he said, "You take a pencil, a pen, and you put it to paper, and you bleed." And 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 I think I think that's exactly uh, um, when you said that it's almost like an obsession, putting pen to paper, that you have to keep writing. You know your thoughts, little on little pieces of paper and things like that until the materialize into a story. So from there, um, writing uh, stories for the, Fa uh, the Faxes newspaper and things, how did that evolve to be your first book? Which, which book? Oh, how my first book came about? Yeah, yeah. Oh, but you know- oh, Okay, how long was it after after you were writing these short stories at CWA before you started actually crystallizing all of these poems into a completed volume? Oh, that took years, you know, and okay. as a woman and and women, women do a lot, okay? As a woman, and you have the challenge of uh, what you want to be in life, whether you want to just be, a, if you're an African woman, and no matter how brilliant you are, there are expectations on you, and to get married, and to have children right after you get married, and... And then we had the added responsibility of being responsible for the house as well. So um, I wrote forever. I wrote, um, I think my first story got published by Henry Carter. Um, yeah, Henry Carter in his little book. And um, that was, that was, that's not a poem. I had a poem and a story published in that book. And those are not things I'm proud of today, but I was a young girl, you know, I was, Practically in high school when he published that book. Okay, so, and I wrote as a child and growing up all those years, I wrote all kinds of poems. Yeah, I have poems in books that I managed to save. Even my yearbook from college, I opened my yearbook and all over the book was poems, pages that I just wrote everywhere. I used to write uh, so much so that I would burn the food. You know, we gribble girls are taught to cook. And my stepmother would smell the food going in and she would come. She wants to whip. One time she wanted to whip me because I bring her right. And my father saw, I asked, and my father said, what happened? And I said, I was writing a poem. And then my father picked up the poem and he started reading and he said, Mara, Mara, she wrote a poem. <laughs> <laughs> she wrote a poem. She wrote a good poem. And my stepmother couldn't read much, couldn't read and write. And so all I always used that for an excuse. If I didn't do my homework, if I told my, once I told my father I was writing, he would forgive me, you know. And so that's how it was. And then when I got married, I continued to write. You know, one of the things about a writer is you write until the day you can get published. And I have to tell the young people out there because a lot of times people think once you think you are a writer, you are growing my work. 
only became good enough when I was almost out of college. And when I was out of college and teaching, because I had to grow, you know, as a writer with no resources in Liberia. Right. And so that's how, and uh, now my first book. That, that's I have book. Uh -huh. Before you get to your first book, because, yeah, because I, she's, I, I'm mm -hmm. interested in, uh, because you were writing these things, uh -huh. was there anyone checking them to say, oh, do it this way, you know, this is wrong, this is how you should construct <laughs> these sentences? Was there anybody doing that for you? Not really. Not really. Yeah, and these children that I'm teaching are blessed. Not really. We, I, I was part of the Liberian Association of Writers that was formed after I finished college in the eighties. Okay, so um, we went to write. We went to writing and uh, um, went to writers meeting, and we. I don't remember much about us analyzing and critiquing one another's work. But we listen to each other's poem. And I learned early what a good poem was by reading a lot. I read a lot of literature in high school. In fact, my high school librarian, Mrs. Annie Bell, Annie Blay. Annie Blay reminded me last year, she called me. Annie Blay was the librarian. I don't know whether she was when you were there, Jackie, in CWA. And I would borrow the I would borrow books. We could only borrow a novel at a time. And I would read so much. So she made a bargain with me and said, oh, little girl, it looks like you like to read. You will be somebody one day. I can work with you and have you borrow more books than you can borrow. If you promise me, you will read them and bring them back. And that's how so I was reading a lot. I was reading poets, Nigerian poets, and part of studying literature in high school. So most of what I... I, I knew people who were writers, and and uh, Carter Henry Carter and Henry yeah. Carter. Yes, he was my teacher one time. He but he was not my English teacher. And then I had an English teacher, Mr. John Rudy, who was an American former Peace Corps. He and um, used to encourage me and um, to write. So the only person who always said my work was quite fair was my father. <laughs> <laughs> He was my biggest fan until I wrote a poem. Well, he was even afterward, but one day he discovered a poem I wrote called Discipline. And and he was so mad, he <laughs> took it and, I, and I lost that. He took it because he said, um, 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 my father was, um, my father disciplined everything. I remember two or three lines. One line said, um, from um, my, uh, the Famaka bed, the creaking chairs, my father disciplined. He disciplined <laughs> everything from the children to the furniture. <laughs> the furniture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so and he said I was writing bad stuff about him, you know, but he was still my fan. That's the that's the one person. Then I had um in college, well, in a librarian association writers, I had Mrs. Altia Mark. And she was a very much support. I remember in the 80s. She said to me, you write so well, yeah, you will be the poet of the generation in the 1980s. So, but the 80s ended without me becoming the poet of the, <laughs> of the generation. So when the 80s ended, I'm like, okay, Mrs. Mark. Okay, Mrs. Mark, where are you? You know, where am I now? So, yes, yeah, so I didn't have... Uh, you know, besides a few people who were in a writing group with me in the writing association, who um, we read each, we read out loud to one another and uh, in meetings, and we have uh, so so I grew in that company. I heard their work and I heard mine, and and for from for some reason because I was reading authors, many authors like John Pepper Clark. I love his. Yes. Yes, I was reading and um, Wallace Shrinkers and uh, uh, um, so, um, uh, uh, he didn't write. I always gave him credit for to New York, but I think it was another author that wrote to New York. Okay, but I read a lot of these poets, you know, and I think and I read E.E. E. Cummings. I used to love E.E. E. Cummings. I, I used to love um, 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 some of the like Auden, W.E. Auden. 
who was a war poet. I was always intrigued by war poets. Yeah. D.H. Lawrence was one of, Lawrence. Them, yeah, yeah. one of my favorite. And I think I was always, one, one of the things, I think one of the things that, that helped me connect to them was the Gribble Aura Tradition. That's why I was interested in your discussion last week. The African Aura Tradition, the Gribble Aura Tradition. The dirges the village women sang and the praise songs in our Gribo tradition, which I picked up in a village when I stayed there for three years. Those connect, and the, when I heard them singing those dirges, they were poetic and, and they were actually scripted. They were those women, you know, I, I, I live in a village and I discover that the village women actually were schooled to, to perform. And, you know, you would be walking and from with other kids or the family or you would be in a bush doing something and you were here wailing you were here yeah. wailing and you would run out to find out if somebody died but you would listen to the wailing and then the women would laugh then another woman would say you go and then they would they would perform this dirge and they would sing this song but they are yeah. not Willing, they are practicing so that when their ugly father-in-law dies, they will know <laughs> how to <laughs> how to will. So yes, yeah. Yes. So this this kind of tradition influenced um, me uh, in the very beginning because I had learned it. And in my father's house, my father was the patriarch of his family, extended family. So mats were often you know, brought into our house, you know, some relative would die and our house was the big house that they would put a mat down on. And so I watched them, I watched the people in the, in Tuvalu, I watched the people in Morovia perform. And, and most of those were dirges. So they were not far from war poems, you know, yeah. Yeah, and I think I think it's important to 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 look at it also as an extension of the culture. Because if you if you look at even even within the African American community, uh, funerals are big events. People go to funerals, you know, and 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 in in Liberia, I mean, wake can take two three days in the villages. People sing and they remember people. So 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 cultural practices being put to to, to word as it is 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 um. It's very interesting, but but uh, um, oh, Dennis, do you have a question for Prof? No, we, we can go to our first uh, first book now and how you know she was inspired to write that, as you asked earlier. Oh, okay, sorry, Prof. It's all over to you again. Well, so the tell first, us about your the first, first book. book um, half of that first book was done, or more than half of it was done in Liberia. Poems like Morovia Women, and you know, many poems in the book were done in Morovia. And some of the poems were written in the war. In the war, before the war, I was writing mostly short stories. In high school, I wrote mostly poems. And then during the war, I switched to writing poetry because um, poetry is able to capture a moment immediately and fast and quickly than fiction. When you start writing a short story, while you are running as a refugee, you need a lot of pages, you need a lot of paper, and you're writing with hand, and you need time to plot the, the plot and the, and the setting and the characteristics. You can't do it. You can't do it with fiction. So um, most of the time on the run, I was writing many of the poems that are in the first book, and, and I was writing them while bombing was taking place. I would hide in the corner, and I will scribble on a piece of paper, write a poem, and, and tie it up and put it in my purse. And that's how I did. And that's when I found out that poetry provides you the time, provides you uh, inspiration uh, in the urgent moment. Yeah. And so that's why. The, so then I found out that I was the other reason. And then I, I was writing more of those for that first book also because um, poetry hides much of it and um, much 
poetry hides a lot of the, the pain through metaphor and figures of speech. So with, with fiction, and I found it was difficult to talk about a woman being raped and in detail without breaking my own heart. But I could do it in, in poetry because poetry uses symbolism and metaphor. And, and so it's not as, so the blood is not as, it's not spilled the way it would be spilled in fiction. So, so the poetry hides pain. It's able to talk about pain in brief and detail, in very brief detail and by the use of literary tools like figurative language, symbolism, and images. And so that's when I thought that poetry would do it better for me. And so I spent more time writing the poems. So by the time, by the time we came to the US in the 91, I had mostly, I had over 100 pages of poetry. And, but there were no publication, publishing in Liberia anyway. So, and I continued to write while when we lived in Michigan, I went to poetry readings. I read on the radio. I remember my mother was here. I used to read on the radio almost every Saturday. And she would sit and listen to me read and cry. And I would come home, she would still be crying. I would, that's when I wrote poems like Child Soldier. And, and home, I wrote a lot of poems about the war because the war was ongoing and we're getting, so it was like a reportage. I was trying to capture history in my poem. I wanted a Liberia's history to be registered in my poetry because Liberia doesn't have a history. So, um, so then I moved to, we moved to Karamazoo, Michigan, and I was trying to publish my book. My first book, I had almost 200 pages of poetry by that time, by the mid 90s. And so I sent, without knowing, I hope students who want to write are listening. And a book of poems do not be longer than a hundred pages. And except it is a collective poems like this one. It should, it should be between 45 to 70 pages. Okay, 45 to 70 pages. So I sent 250 pages to uh, publishers in Nigeria, when I was in Michigan, to so, uh, um, Kenya, uh, in Kenya, I sent my poems all over America, the book. And I've never heard from any of those publishers except a publisher in Kenya, um, the big publisher that I used to publish, uh, the East Africa publisher. So they wrote me and they said they love my poems, but they weren't publishing individual books anymore. So they wanted, but they were publishing an anthology of East African poets called Echoes in the Valley. And they wanted to publish three of my poems. Yeah, and even though I was in East African, they will, they will accommodate a West African, only one West African poet. So they, they were my first real publisher of my poetry. And so then in 98, I applied for a grant that I didn't get in Michigan. And then the woman who didn't give me the grant and I met and we had a fight. She was a professor, <laughs> I was not a professor. And we went into the meeting and the first thing she said was, who do you think you are? You always on the radio, this and that. You think you something. And I say, is that why you didn't give me the grant? And then we had a big fight. And then she asked me for two of my poems. And she said, and she was gonna give it to a poet who would call me and tell me I was a terrible poet. And I needed to go to school and learn how to write poetry. I was a terrible poet, I was not a poet. That's what this woman <laughs> told me. So I gave her my two poems. She went to the university and gave the two poems to Mr. Herb Scott, and he read them. And he called me in less than an hour. And then he says to me, did you write these two poems? Those poems were Moravia Wimmy and Homecoming. And, and I said, yes. And he said, if you, he said, these are wonderful poems. 
I said, but your colleague said they are horrible poet poems. <laughs> they are a terrible poet. He said, you are a good poet if you have if you have 50 pages of such poetry, I'm coming for them. And so I said, if you serious be Amado in one hour, he was Amado in 30 minutes. And I, I was so upset with everybody. I just grabbed my thing and pushed it 200 pages in the hand of the old man. And he took them. And in a few days, he called me. He said, you are a marvelous poet. I want to publish your book. So that's how my book I got. Wow. Yeah. Dennis, never take no for an answer. <laughs> yes, and, and, and that book is before the palm could bloom. Before the palm. of Africa. Oh, yes. So, so Dennis, do you want to um, take some? I mean, uh, read some yeah. comments before? Yeah. No. What, what I want to ask, or uh, prof, is uh, <laughs> now I understand why because the first story I read was. You no, know, you know, by you was in that anthology which nocturnal being. No, that, that's terrible. That's a terrible poem. No, that was a <laughs> short story. Oh yeah, that story. Yeah. yeah, and I like it very much. Yeah, but yeah. then, as I started reading you, I didn't see any short story. I didn't see any fiction, and only poems. And at that time, for me, poems were so hard to understand. I'm like, I want to read uh, from Wesley books, but this poem. <laughs> So now I understand why you chose or you went more into poetry than nonfiction, than uh, fiction. So that was good for you to let me know. My next book might be a collection of short stories. So I have a, I have short stories. Two I've already let, let me just make our readers or our audience to know that uh, some of your books, Becoming Ebony, The River is Rising, Where the Road Turns. Before the palm could bloom, when the wanderers come home, and uh, what I have here now, pray song for my children, new and selected poems. And you guys need to get a, get copies of this uh, uh, book of poetry and read them because they are spectacular. Yeah, could we go to quite some comments now, Dennis? So she, so Prof knows who's watching. Yeah, <laughs> let, let's let's get some from our comments. Uh, Emmanuel Jackson is watching from Boston. Matthias, Tommy, Nancy, greetings, joining from Yekepa, Nimba County. So wow. You have, you have Yekepa in the house. And then uh, Chia Jeb, uh, Jebo is watching. And guess who else is watching? Yeah, Mrs. <laughs> Mark is watching from, <laughs> from Switzerland. Right, so finally found the interview on Jackie Sire's Facebook after midnight here in Basel, Switzerland. Lovely to hear both of you. What's about me? <laughs> yeah, well, he was our professor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, yes, and she's getting some <clears throat> love here, Professor it's Alita Romeo Mark. Joining us, thank you so much for watching. Eduardo yeah. Boss de Basco. Yeah. yeah. He said, thanks for this great enterprise. He, he's in Nigeria. He's oh. in he's in Ibadan. Oh, wow. Ibadan. So Musu Wangosti was a yet. Mrs. Mark was an excellent instructor. Queenie is watching from, and then our friend from Ibadan said, before the palm could bloom, can't wait to read this work. And we'll put the link uh, on the board where you can find this and we can discuss. See, I was discussing with a circle of young librarian poets and Professor Patricia Jabel Wesley is on the spiritually the queen of librarian literature. And he's telling us, he's joining us from Ibadan. Yes. Those are some of the uh, comments we have so far, Jackie. Okay, and um, uh, uh, Prof, I, uh, we were also discussing the different themes in your book and the topics of your book, and, and we're thinking that it's a pattern, right? That I, I think that the, the titles of your books, they are evolutionary, they chart, and I could be wrong, but I think they chart 
an evolutionary process of the country and, and experiences. Because if you look at before the palms could bloom, right? And then you became ebony. And then the river is rising. And then where the road turns. And now we've almost come full circle. Praise song for the children. What do you think? I could be wrong, but but tell me, Prof, how did you choose the titles for those you, for those you, books? You know, when I saw Jackie arrange them like that, I'm like, whoa. You know, Dennis, there is something about writing. When you're writing your nonsense, you don't know that it will make sense to somebody else. <laughs> it makes sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> you're writing your crap. You know, in your little corner, when you look, somebody thinks it's poetry. I'm not joking. You, <laughs> you know, before the palm could bloom. Yes. Yeah. One time I saw I got I saw Jackie's arrangement, and I'm like, oh my god, this girl is crazy. She says, before the palm could bloom, the uh, 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 um, becoming ebony. Okay, and then she yes. says, where the road turns. No, that the, the, the river uh, is rising. The river is rising where the road turns. Okay, that's what she said. Yes. The river is yes. rising where the road turns, and then when the wanderers come home, praise, praise songs. <laughs> yes, I don't know. Yes, uh, this is what I. This is what I have done. Almost, um, let me see. I think every book I've written has come through a title. So before the palm could bloom, it's a poem in the book. Yes. It, you know, and, and so and becoming ebony is a poem in the book. And, yes. and the river is rising is a poem in the book. It's, um, almost all of them, the poem was before the book. And I think only one time where the road turned was written, and then I decided on a title. And the poem in our book is actually where the road turn, not turn. So we just change and move the past tense to the turn. So I think most of the time, all the poems were in a book, and then I decided to make the poems those titles without any idea there would be any order. So when That's I saw order. that, when I saw that order. I thought Jackie is brilliant. She is more brilliant than me. <laughs> I was sitting here, but I can't. That, that, but, <laughs> but, 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 okay, you see, you see, my, my reasoning is let's say take a young child, right? Mm -hmm. Before the child could bloom, before the palms could bloom, mm -hmm. walking, right? Yeah. And if you look at that, the person left, let's say they came to the United States, right? Mm -hmm. And if you look at some of those poems, in Becoming ebony, you become you you you're coming into your you own. Become strong. If you you're becoming you should, ebony. You should read yeah, that then, poem. That poem is about yeah. becoming strong. Yes, you know, and then so, after becoming yeah. ebony, you're looking at the river is rising because you know there are some things in the culture that you are that you get mm -hmm. angry. So the anger is rising, the river is rising, and then mm -hmm. what happened? That road turns. So you're turning mm -hmm. now, but where are you turning? <laughs> you're turning to go where. The wanderers are coming home. And then when you come home, what do you do? You have you a do praise, praise song. song. You know when you yes. Yes, you know that. Yes, Once I you think have, so. I think it makes when sense. When you come home, they start praising you and then praise song. Yes. For my children. Yes. Who are coming home. The children are when they came home, but now they're praising them. Oh, yeah. When the wanderers yeah. come. You praise yeah. them. That's, what? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. So, so Jackie has uh, run a theme through all the books, and that's wonderful. She's going to write a yes. paper about it. Yes. She's going to write a paper. I'm not joking. That's a challenge. Write a, so, write a scholarly paper about the crazy professor you had. <laughs> so, Prof, what, what, I mean, I mean, looking in, in the future, I mean, just a question I have. What do you see? What, what do you see? What's the future for Liberian writers? And, and how do you see Liberian, Liberian writing fitting into the, into the, social fabric of Liberia? Liberian writing, Liberian writers are accidental. Um, 
What do I mean by accidental? They happen accidentally despite Liberia. Even the writers that were writing in the 1800s, as, as I'm working on the anthology, and which I have now changed to only an anthology of poetry um, because of the weak fiction in a book. The, the, the fiction is too weak to, to get into the publishing world at this point. Um, and it's too much, there's too much to do to work with them and the, the writers are dead. You can't, you can't do much without violating them. So it's gonna be an anthology of poetry. When you look at the poems from the 1800, and up to this point, I would say accidental. Because the, the Liberian writers did not become career writers. They had talent, they had, they had talent, but the vision of the country limited their vision for writing. Mm. To be a writer, you have to choose a career that gives you time to write. If you are a good writer, you are a crazy person. What do I mean? You are so obsessed with writing, you burn stuff. You, you write it supersedes everything. I, 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 but you can't do it in a country where you have no food to eat, where you, you have to join the government and, and have a full-time job that gives you no time to write. So Liberian writing tomorrow for us to have real writers, we have to have at least two or three or four or five people in this upcoming generation who will decide to be writers and stick to it. We talk about when I started writing, people started asking me when you want to, what you want to be when you grow up. When I was a child, you know, when I was doing that in my father's house, I would say, I want to be a writer. And my father's guests would say, what is wrong with you? You so smart, what you be a writer for? You should do, be a doctor. You should be a doctor, you should be a lawyer. And they used to do it so much, my father said, leave her alone. She will be anything she wants to be. What do you wanna be? I say, I wanna be a writer. So if you decide to be a writer, you have a lot of people who will laugh at you. And then you have a lot of people who will make it difficult for you. And then you will have a country that has no place for writing. No place, no grants, no, no recognition. Look at me. Look at me. I'm more recognized in other African countries than in Liberia. Let me give you an example. I was in Kenya for a conference, for a writer, for a writing festival. I didn't plan to, to speak on the radio in Kenya. I didn't know that the Kenya Broadcasting System, which is a big, huge, mega broadcasting system, had talked to the director of the festival that they needed an interview with me. Well, the director of the inter uh, festival mismanaged the entire festival and ate up our time for any kind of interview. But usually when I travel, I try to leave a day free before leaving the country you know, because I want to recuperate before I get on the plane. So the day I had to recuperate, I I got a, a little boy from Nigeria was, you know, a young fellow was saying to me, they wanted to interview you at, at Kenya Broadcast System, let's go there. I said, I don't go to a station to go tell the people I'm in town. I don't do that. So. There was no way he could call the station. So the Nigerian kid walked to the station in Nairobi and he told them, you know who's in town? Patricia Jared Wesley. Before I knew it, the staff were coming to me, coming to my hotel. And they said, we knew you in town. We wanted to interview you. And, they, and I said, I'm leaving tomorrow. I can't do an interview tomorrow. And they put me in the schedule. 
They came for me, brought car, took me for interview, and they broadcast that interview all over East Africa. And they knew who I was. If I go to Liberia, eh? and the Liberian broadcasting system, one time they had a director there in 2016 or 15 who wanted to interview me because a politician had told them they wanted to hear my voice on the radio. <laughs> so he sent his big car to get me. I'm thinking, oh, Liberia is Syria. I went to the station. I, they made me record three hours of my reading. So they will, they will, they will broadcast my poem every week for, for a year. Whoa. You know what they did? Huh? They dumped it in the trash. Why? Because Liberia does not know the importance of the art, literature. They do not know and they do not care. So, so that's, <laughs> that's, that's the problem. So like, the future of Liberian literature will happen accidentally. Liberian literature will, will become because young people want to write, not because they have opportunity. It's going to be maybe 20 years before when those young people grow up, hopefully they will take over, they will be part of the government, and they will remember the art. Mm -hmm. They will remember to support artists and writers and musicians. Look at the musicians that are singing. Do they have grants? Those young people could get grants, go to Ghana, go to Nigeria, and train, and train, so that they will know how to compose, so they will know how to make music, so they will study on a musician, you see? And also Liberian, Liberian writers, Liberian young people, um, who will thrive and write, have to be humble. They have to be humble. They have to understand that you don't become famous overnight. Many of us have been writing. I've been writing since I was 13. I mean, it's 60. Eh? I'm over 60. And they want to compete with me who have been writing for the last 50 some years. And when you try so, to teach, when you try to teach them, they say, "Oh, she tried to get famous on me." You understand? So, so Doctor Wesley, what would it take? You know, because you say, uh, "What would it take?" It would yeah. take humility. It would take humility, number one. When somebody critiques your work, eh, you should give them chance to teach you. You should. And you, it, it will take humility. It will take a lot of reading. It will take people wanting. I have conducted free workshops that make me thousands. But I don't charge. But yet, I go to Liberia and I hear some people say, you got to pay the children if you want them to come to write a workshop. And I'm like, I will not pay them. I may give them food. You know, if the workshop is all day, I might provide snacks and food for them, mm. but I can't pay them to teach them. So it would take dedication. It would take people writing in spite of it. Look, when I when I got married, it was hard to write because I had a family and I had a job and I had this and I had you guys to teach. But guess what? I found time to write. I remember one day I was writing and I was changing my baby's diaper on the diaper table and I got inspired to write a poem so I left the baby on the diaper table. I was ready to pull him, and the baby was in strapped. And my husband saw it. He said, "Oh my God, this woman will kill my baby for a poem." <laughs> so you have to, you have to write against all odds. It doesn't mean you gotta dump your baby, but you have to find time to write, and you have to find time to learn how to write to put a. I hope we find time to read. I want to read some poems. Oh, yeah, yes, that's, definitely. That's, that's, I, what, I, that's yeah. what we're coming to. And, um, and I was okay. curious, even when you, even those titles, every time I look at your book and I look at the titles of these poems, how do they come about? 
how really they come, they come, they come about by inspiration mm -hmm. yeah by inspiration. I, I, you, you know uh prof two things i mean f for me i find it very sad when when people are uh, saying uh, talking about mark twain or Walt whitman's leaves of grass you know um uh, works that are very that are very uh, uh close to the, to the to the soul of america and i always say well what do we have and I think that, you know, people, you're right when you say that people are so, um, they are so busy looking for their daily bread. But what the people don't understand or what they should be aware of is that you also need to feed the soul. You need to have inspiration, something to move you forward. And I think that our country do a great disservice to writers, to poets, and to people who want to elevate, you know, elevate through the arts i think that there should be a place for for writers i think that every july 26th you know before any oration there should be a poem read you know something that uplifts the country because our our i mean the people even if your soul is crushed you know you, i mean when we had joe biden and we had the young the young lady reading her poem people were all oh she's the you know she's so incredible and i said how many of you would even pick up a book of poems written by a liberian author you know and and like we said last time with roland dempster when roland dempster wrote the mystic reformation of gondolia that's what he said he said that this book if it doesn't do anything it will give lie to what people say that liberians don't write because liberians do write you know, and 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 yeah, Liberians we are. Don't, don't, Liberians don't write. Liberians, well, they they write it. The writers we've produced over almost two hundred years shows that. Like, look, if you want to be a writer, the last time I read an interview by Wilton Sankawolo, somebody interviewed him, and he was blaming the Liberian Writers Association. He was blaming the government. Blaming a lot of our people who go into government forget forget themselves and the art. When I read that interview, I said, okay, thank you. you were interim president. You were government official in a dual years. Did you remember us? That's the question I asked. We were writing in Liberia when Sagawolo was in a dual government. We're writing. So if I, if somebody, I, I don't want to be a librarian government official, I'm running away from that. But I, I told them, if you gave me your job, half of the time, I would just be teaching people how to write and trying to get grants for librarian writers and librarian musicians to go to school. That's all I would be doing. Mm -hmm. Because we are way behind. We are way behind. The other thing is we have librarian writers who were writing with me, who were who and I were writing together and reading each other other's poems. Those very writers, when I asked, when they gave me their work, when I critique it, it's an insult to them. I went to I went to grad school where I was in class with all white people. And I would write my poem about Africa. And they had to tear it apart and critique it. That's how you learn in grad school. You don't learn from the professor per se. Most of the time, you are learning from each other. If Liberians will allow themselves, but because of a lot of ignorance, many people will not allow themselves to learn from the best among them. They will not. They, they, will, they will rather talk about you and say you are this and you are that. Or they will be tribalistic. But you cannot grow. You cannot grow by doing that. And the other thing, the leaders have to, they have to think about the future of a country that does not have a good literature. Yes. You yes. see? All, all the governments, when Ellen Johnson Sally for inaugur being inaugurated, I got a call from BBC. 
while I was writing the poem, The River is Rising, which has Ellen Johnson Salif in it. They wanted me to talk to them, and I said, call me back. I'm writing a poem. They said, okay, we'll call you back so you will read that poem. So they called me back. The next day, we made a range where I went to Penn State uh, Radio Station. They did radio to radio, and I read as if I was sitting in London. Then afterwards, I saw Ellen Johnson Salif's speech. She was quoting a foreign poet. Ellen Johnson Salif and every president of Liberia would rather quote a foreign poet than quote a Liberian. At the same time, she had all my books. We're talking about 2000. She had, yeah, she had two books that I had already read. People gave her my books all the time. She, she quoted a foreigner. When Ted Kennedy was honoring Michael Francis, Bishop Archbishop Francis, giving him the Grabber F. Kennedy Peace Award in 19, in, two, in, 2000, in 1999 or 2000. You know who he quoted? Ted Kennedy quoted me. I didn't even know it until news people were sending me newspaper clips of that because Ted Kennedy knew that to be relevant to Michael Francis who was a bishop from like West Africa and Liberia he needed to put a Liberian right even though he didn't know me that's what it means to be a literary person but it, but all of this goes to to the thing we talk about long ago the Liberian mindset the Liberian mindset must be liberated. That's what Blyden said. Edward Wilmer yes. Blyden, we did him two weeks ago. A long time ago. He said, he said it. Yes, he said you had to. So, so uh, Prof, I will say, I will quote a poem for you that it may take another decade, but, and I quote, there will come a time. And that's one of my favorite poems. There will come a time, you know? So, so, I mean, I could I could listen to you for ten more hours and not get tired. From, but you promised me you're gonna read my poem. You're going to read some of our poems, and I have every poem in a in any one of your book is my favorite. And I made a list of mine, and I I had I had twelve, <laughs> and then I added three more. I have fifteen. So. <laughs> I, 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 I have some that I want you to read, but I know that you have your own. So I, I want you to read your poem that you want to read and we can talk about the inspiration before Dennis and I gave you our list. We're not going to ask you to read all of them, but we just I want to hear- read Dennis's poem he wanted me to read long time ago. Dennis! Dennis, you, you remember the poem? Yeah, that, that was when she was doing a, a, some reading. What? Yeah, yeah. Oh, Dennis, you. I didn't remember <laughs> the name again. Yeah, I, I, no, that was that Tubaken. was that, that was about death. Tubaken. Yes. That okay, let's see, guys. No. Yes. You Do you want to read, read that? Is that it, Dennis? No, no let, let's go by let's let's go by what Dr. Wesley want to read first before we start okay. giving you our list. Oh, but I already I already marked the poem, so I'm gonna read. It. Good. It's, it's long, but I'm going to try and read it. Tubaken, a song. A rat, he remember because. Dennis, you ever lived, you ever spent time in a village? Yes, I did. Okay. Then you know what I'm talking about him. A ripened bread not hits the ground at the outskirts of town. Tubaken boys have knit clothes run a game. Who will be the first to find its smashed fruit, one of its kind, seeds scattered beneath the intermingling of giant mango, banana, and orange trees? War dancers in raffia skirts, jingling belt ankles, stomping village dust in a dusky 
December day. Dark Lord is so hard to dance when veteran dancers are in the lead. But Bella, too, here he comes. Red, rag chalks, and charcoal pin pasted onto his cheeks. His face is scary mass. He pulls out his tongue, stretching it into a mile about himself. Only the age can explain as onlookers run indoors. The doo-doo flaps her wings, a song for the young that were just hatched. The white doves will come home for Christmas to hear her young sing. Elders chewing red cola nuts laugh loudly. Proverbs are talking under the cotton tree, sipping palm wine as drums rack the ground in an earthquake of festivals older than the earth. Trumpets follow. Then come the town's women renowned, years buried under hanging eyelids, feet slapping graciously the ground, hips rocking in defiance of age, arms swinging. These bourgeois dancers feed dance life into this soil. We will come to town today before the town crier calls home the night. When Kui begins singing near the outskirts of town, Kwajale will sound. Women and children will run for doors. Doors will be latched when Kui makes his way here. The old men and the young men will find laughter again. Women will be born, will grow breasts and find men will birth babies for men, then find age when teeth fall out. Women will lean lightly against their kings and go graciously to dark graves, never setting eye on we. The doo-doo flaps her wings, her song for the young that just learned to fly. Someday they will fly away and join the chorus of doo-doo songs. Drum pounders sit in that line at Tuakai under the bow bow tree, pounding short drums, tall drums. Okay, that's a block. <laughs> drums, drums with wide bottoms, long-legged drums, patient drums. Pounders sweat as though they are the ones pounded. Village children run screaming, following dancers overtaken by their dance. Now Tubake, like a stillborn, stilled. No arguments for those slapping life into its wrinkled bottom. The bread nut still falls though, and the breadfruit tree too. The cocoa and mangoes are full. Fruit falling, smashed, piling under overgrown brushes, abandoned in the sudden rush of war. Cola nuts are full now, ripening by empty suns, half moon years. And the coconut trees now touch the sky. On the ground, dry coconuts are sprouting everywhere. Every now and then, a mango hits the ground. Worms and groundhogs have much to eat. Palm branches still wave though, and the wind blows from Tuakens hills. The forest has taken the street from us who used to own the forest. The doo-doo flaps her wings, her dirge for the young that were not hatched. An owl on the cotton tree branch rolls its coconut eye. Where did the village folk go? The elders who used to drag their long calflas on red, dusty river ground in the harvest drumming. Where did the women go? Their heads that could balance the pail of water while their arms swung or held on to infants falling out the lapas grip on their backs. 
Where are the young girls who held time in the folding of their palms, chalk cheeks, tinted for village boys to see? I, with long, bushy lashes, careless girl, polished face. Wow. Okay, Dennis, that's 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 powerful, but that's five poems. So I have to have <laughs> Yo, that was a long that was a that, long time. That was a long poem, but you don't worry, I've been reading this book for three weeks now. My publisher is turning it into audible. Mm. Audible is gonna turn it into a, a, an audible, and you know me, I fussy. I told them the only book voice that would be on it would be mine. So now I have the trouble of recording it in a studio on my campus. So I've been reading the poems. I'm almost done reading it, reading them. And so don't worry, I can read anything. <laughs> and, and Prof, you have to start putting those poems in Gribble. They have to go in Gribble. <laughs> in that yeah. <laughs> but 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 so I have mine now. I um yeah. I, I I I have I, I have I have so many. And audience, if you if you if you've read the book. And you have one that you want Prof to read, please put it in the chat. The first one I have, Prof, you know. Some women are made, it, some it, women are made of steel. If it's not in a book, let me know because not some all the women, no, some it. women are made of steel. That's the oh, some of us are made of steel. Some of that's us are one. made of steel. It's a that's the first one. one. Yes. That's the, that's the one Jackie always talk about. Yes, that's my <laughs> book, my poem. Come on, bro. <laughs> that's that's, that's the poem. One. All of them, like even the newspaper people, they keep talking about it. Yes, some of us are made of steel. Some of us are made of steel. So you want me read it? Yes, please. That's one of the poems that is not. Now we didn't talk about certain things. Some of the poems are literally written in Gribble. You know, they're just English, like that that one there, that song, that dirge that was singing. Is literally from the gribble and rhythmic tradition. So some of the poems I write them, I'm writing them in English, but I'm taking them in gribble. And then some of them I'm taking them in English. So some of us are made of steel is definitely very Western in its yes. you know, yes. style. Yeah. Okay. Some of us are made of steel. Some of us are made of steel. Some of us are made of twigs. Some of us break in order to stand and rise above the bend. Some of us bend and wobble and rock to the rhythm of all the scars we pick up as the roads wind us up in its hard grip and toss us up in the cold, sometimes hot air against the dashing, against the walls of life. Some of us are made of jelly, soft to the touch. But when life gives us a blow, we slide and glide. And before you know it, we've made it to the other side, away from destruction, surviving the punches only jelly could take. Some of us are made of tears, 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 and we weep hard so rain falls on hardened drought, weary soil. And then the rivers swell and swell and swell because somehow life has made us cry. But in our tears, salt, healing, salt, and forever. We are forever. Yes, some of us are forever. No matter what you toss at us, we rise again and again and again, like that old river in my backyard at home, that river that rises, and we say, oh, the river, and then it goes away, and we say, oh, the swamp. Some of us are hard. Sometimes the river, sometimes the rock. I like that poem, Prof. I really like that poem. Dennis, you got that one? Poem. Yes. You are made of steel, Dennis. You are made <laughs> of steel. And, 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 and I know what it. I'm talking. I'm not flattering. Thank I know you. you. 
and, and, and when you were reading that, some are made of jelly, of twigs, and the different things. Is that a bad thing? Because from the real, no, it's not bad. It, it's not bad. No, it's not bad. Some of us are because the jelly, the jelly absorbs the shocks. This jelly can absorb the shock and become stronger. So no, it's not. It's not a bad thing. It's. Re I and love that break, poem. And we break. So we're meant, so we have survived. Stronger, stronger, stronger yeah. in the broken places. It, it reminds me of this. There's on, uh, there is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Yeah, you know? look at that. Yes. <laughs> Prof, my second, my, my, uh, I have two more. Don't, don't let her take the time, Dennis. I'm going to be reading no, Dennis for Cornell. Had that long time. I'm going to be reading for Cornell, her school. Yes, she, yes, next week. She gets in the there's only two more. I have one love song before the sun goes down. I oh, like that one. And I wanted to read it. <laughs> yes, <you> read it. <laughs> you know, I choose, I choose to sit on my couch in one of my living rooms because I wanted it to be conversational. Yes. I yes. didn't want to use my room with all the bookshelves. <laughs> I wanted it to be a conversation like you sitting here and I'm sitting there. That's why I wanted it to be. Yeah, that this poem I wrote it. It's about how these old men marry young girls, and 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 then they they the old and the girls don't want them. So I was poking fun at the African old man who's married to a young girl. I remember the first time it was published. It was published in a uh, in Jala magazine, the Journal of African Literature. So the editor asked me for poems many years ago, and I gave him this poem, and he published it with other poems of mine. Then we went to the ALA, African Literature Association meeting, <laughs> and then he saw me and all the guys gang up on me, and they're like, you rascal, Af you rascal Liberian, Liberian poet. Look at what you wrote <laughs> to you. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's, I, I like it because it's funny, but yeah, I like that. <laughs> Love song before the sun goes down. I'm afraid of losing you, Titi, my love. Your laughing eyes now so cold. Even when the gate of your front teeth still tingles my heart while you grow cold. When the sun goes down on my heart and there are no more children, singing under the moonlight and the village boys come out with their sleeping eyes titi do not let your heart wander from me oh <laughs> i grow old titi i grow old but my love for you titi my love sits fresh like pebbles in the stream where the lover escaping his lover's flames was drowned in a stream so shallow, but the lover escaping the flames of his lover was still drowned face down. He was found lying face down. Titi, my beautiful dark skinned bride. Is it not you that you seek, Titi, my bride? Is it not the horn blower that you want, Titi? I am still the horn blower who fell for you at the onset of not just your youth. I am still the home blower that you loved with the love of fresh dew drops. Do not let the fire grow dim, Titi, my love. Do not let the timbers burn themselves out on this old love. Titi, oh Titi, my beautiful long haired bride. <laughs> I like it, bro. Yo, <laughs> I like that, it. That, that is that is not funny. <laughs> no, no, I just like it. I, I, I yeah, like it. This yeah. old man is crying for Titi, and you like it, and you know Titi is going. <laughs> yeah, I, I like, I like. So, so, Prof, um, uh, um, one of the one of the um, poems that you wrote was about they kill a black man in Brooklyn today. And 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 I read it and I felt very sad. And I wanted to ask, um, 
did you write it when right away when you heard it or how, how did you go about writing this poem because it's a very sad but reflective poem and i would I like to know it, how i wrote it as that. the news was happening okay yeah like you said the urgency in the in the urgency of the time okay yeah i just I, 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 I wrote it you know and when i told my students i went after i wrote a poem i went to class and i told my students and then the girls in my class you know we got students from all over the country and the and the, and the girls were like oh dr wesley they kill a black man in brooklyn every day <laughs> you say you know it was like we know it's, it's yeah i wrote mm -hmm. it i had just moved my son to brooklyn and it was near the area he lived that this young man who has um who is who has difficulty of learning you know you had problem you're not quite there and he was carrying an old pipe pipe and it, the demanded he put it down innocent thing he was doing that's an old pipe in his hand and they shot him Hmm. And he was disabled. He was either he had Down syndrome or he, he was disabled and they killed him. Okay. And I didn't know. And I was calling my son and he was not picking up the phone. And and I even after I wrote the poem, then he called me from his office. And no, then I called his office. No, then he called me and then I called his office to tell him that I have found him. And all the girls there were like, yeah, you know, he had just started working in New York. He had moved there. Yeah. So that's how I wrote it. Yeah. When, I wrote, okay. I, when I wrote that poem, the first place I read it was in Pittsburgh. I read mm -hmm. it for a, 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 a reading series that takes place in the summer coming with. And there were only one other black woman and me and my husband in the room. They were all white people. And I remember the black woman was shot. Now somebody was this bold reading the poem in a gathering of almost all white people. And she was shot. You could see the shock on her face. Hmm. And then a few days after I read the poem, a black boy was running in Pittsburgh, young boy, 18 year old, and the police chased him and killed him. And shot him just a few days after. Then I read it again in February, because a new upon February of 19. 19, I read it for my school's big program we had. And my chancellor was crying when I read up on people were cheering. And then one month after that, you know, you think it can't happen in your town. One month after that, the police in our university town, State College, killed the son of one of our best friends and colleagues. Ten State yes, professor. Yes. You remember? Yes. 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 Uh, uh, um, I went to school with her. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. You went. You went to school with a, a young. I, I helped. You know? I helped to raise the little boy who the police yeah. shot. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Right there in State College. So you think it can happen to your child, you know? And I, I, I was in Connecticut that day, and to bury my uncle that had died, and that March day, and a friend of mine, a professor's wife, was in East Africa. He was on sabbatical, and she called me from East Africa, and she said, "Did you hear?" that they kill our friend's son. And I'm like, you know, it, it's, that's what happens. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's a miracle. I, I don't know, I don't think, I don't think you want me to read let, let here. Um, let Eduardo, me. Eduardo, Eduardo wants you to read They Kill a Black Man in Brooklyn Today. Oh boy, that's the poem he wants. <laughs> yeah, that's the poem he wants. My, my, poems, thought, my poems are about a war. You know when the, when you were look when the author was the poet was looking for the two boys, but let's oh, go with Eduardo yeah. first. Okay, they, I got it. It will be my other book. I I don't think it's in this book. 
you know, well, this book doesn't have all my books. It only has. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't yeah, I that. will find it. It's, it might be close by. Yeah. Um, let me see. I should have had all my books there, and they are upstairs. Let me see. Um, they killed a black man. It's in a yeah twenty three. It's twenty three. I read for Eduardo. He is. He follows me. That's what they call follow you. The, the, my, some of the young people I mentor, by the time they add me, they want me to follow them because they have a lot to teach me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but he follows me. So let me read. And to be in Nigeria and be on after 1 a.m. is, is, is yeah. a sacrifice. It's, they killed a black man in Brooklyn today. A dirge for our son. A policeman has just killed a black man in Brooklyn. Today, another black man shot and killed in America, where we must stop our car so a squirrel can cross a busy highway. But another policeman in America has just killed another of our son in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. When my phone alerts me, I feel my belly button turning hot. My legs buckled and I could feel my own fingers trembling around the curves of my phone. Suddenly I forgot I forgot my son's number. I forget the way to call my own son in Brooklyn. My mind tells me it cannot recall how to push the button so my Brooklyn black son can assure me that he is not dead. To be a black woman is to be a woman ready to mourn. To be a black mother is to go to bed with your head halfway on your pillow. To be a black mother in America is to stand between night and day waiting to see if the policeman will not kill your son today. Mm. They say a black man was shot in a city so populated by good black men, they now must empty bullets into another black man. They say a policeman in Brooklyn has decided to shoot a black man because there was a suspect on the run or because he was holding up something or because he was taking something out of his own pocket or because he was just a black man. There should be no black men in Brooklyn if there is a suspect on the bus. There should be no black men in America where there is a suspect on the run. When my phone finally remembers its own number, my son's voice on the line sounds like I have won the lottery. But somewhere another, a mother has just lost her son in Brooklyn. A mother who gave birth to her son is wailing because there was a suspect on the run. Today, I saved the life of a scary doe that ran across my neighborhood road as if it knew the sound of tires, the sound of a passing car, the sound of death. The sound a gun makes before it kills a black man, before it kills a black man in Brooklyn. But they say we must not count. And they say we do not count. One black man was killed today in Brooklyn, but on TV, there is no news. There is no news of the black man killed in Brooklyn. On TV, White people are talking about white people. But somewhere all over America, a black man will be shot the way a black man was shot 
in progress. On TV, white people are talking about white problems. Why a black man swallows a bullet? Why a black a bullet swallows the life of a black man in America? I tell my friends I'm the only poet who cannot read her own poem. <laughs> That's so, Prof, um, sorry, yeah. uh, Dennis, yeah. one more, Prof, why you have the book, um, uh, are you about to read? No, 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 <laughs> no, Ayuba, Ayuba Toure wants you to read the poem that has won a lot of awards one day, and one oh, day is on page, it's on page 84. Ayuba, so, thank you for being on, but are you getting the gold now? <laughs> you think I'm married yet. No, Prof. <laughs> That, that 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 poem is not just about divorce, even though you say for the newly divorce, that poem is about getting over. I read that poem for, for strength. I don't read it you, for getting divorced, you know? So please read one day for Ayoba. I can Dennis, I can pull her leg there. Yeah. <laughs> all well, the people's favorite poems that are her favorite poem. Anyway, she said it. All the poems No, 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 it, that's what she said, Ayoba. <laughs> <laughs> One day, page 84. Okay, <laughs> let me tell you, the first time that poem made notice in America was in 2000, I think it, 2011, 2011, okay, 2011, when it came yeah. out in, in where the road turn. So it was, then everybody had to teach in America, you know, American life in poetry. It was everywhere in it. Time magazine everywhere. Okay, I was disappointed when it was the one selected this time again. So anyway, so I went to work and I had a big letter from a man in uh, in the south. He wrote me and and his he was so mad his wife had divorced him and taken all <laughs> her food. and he thought I was writing it to women. So he was really mad. So he became my friend. He kept calling me. Asking me what well, older man you were like 75. No, and asking me for advice how to move on, like the tree or something, you know, like the tree that the, the tree that was not fell or something like that. Yes, you yes, know? the tree that and was I'm not like, fell. Oh, I'm in trouble, yes. Yeah. So that point gets and, me. And prof, before you read it, I would like to say to you, Ayoba says that her mother experienced divorce, right? His mother, but his, let's, okay, his, his mother. mother, but Eduardo. Eduardo said that one of his favorite poems, and G Play says that one of his favorite poems. So that's not me. Please read their poems. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you for being on. I am very. Uh, G, G Play, G Play is, is a plebo boy. You know, he's one of our children. And Yoba is one of my sons. Like a, a waddle, you know, these are these are our children, you know, but not deeply, not deeply. I don't know you, but but deeply, that my brother from um, Maryland, okay. I won't get in trouble yet, okay. And Mr. Deeply, but right up down there, no, oh, what is it? 84. Oh, 84. Okay. I almost reread Love Song again. <laughs> <laughs> One day, Ooh. okay. Ooh, one day, love song for the newly divorced. You know, the, this poem has blocks. You know that? You ever seen the block? There oh, are no. blocks. There are blocks around this poem. There was a woman called Bossy Betty. She said her husband used to call her Bossy. So she has a blog called Bossy Betty. On her side, they, they, they were arguing that year. They said this woman, she really suffered. Her husband must have really, you know, broken her heart when she wrote this poem, you know. And I'm like, no, that's not about me. I had too many girlfriends. I had to help get divorced. I had to help my friends get them lawyers so they would get money out of their divorce. <laughs> and, and I used to help a lot of my friends get divorced because... The men were beating them up. You know, I had to even help my friend whose husband used to beat her and then kick her out all week. And then she brought her home on Friday and Saturday and Sunday. And then she would cook 
the whole week full, playing the house. <laughs> then she had to go see with her friends, a Nigerian guy. And so when people told me, I call her and she was like, hey, sister, don't talk to him. I said, we're going to fix him. So I said, you know what you do? Um, fix the food when he comes home, let him eat. Then you start argument. You know, I call it, I call it the crisis management people because she was homeless. And she had a one year old and three, two other toddlers, three other toddlers, you know. So I say, you gotta have a place to live. You can't be sleeping around. So guess what? I said, when he come home, start an argument and scream and do everything, let him start beating you. Then you run in the bathroom and call 911. <laughs> <laughs> and she did that. When we looked, the police rescued her and they were able to help her get a place to live instead of being kicked out of her house. You know, mm -hmm. the African way, we can't bring African way in America. So one day is, is inspired by all these women, African women who are struggling with their marriages and people who are trying to treat them like they're in Africa. One day, love song for the newly divorced one day you will awake from your covering and that heart of yours will be totally mended and there will be no more burning within the owl calling in the setting of the sun and the deer path all erased and there will be no more need for love or lovers or fears of losing lovers and there will be no more burning timbers with which to light a new fire. And there will be no more husbands or people related to husbands. And there will be no more tears or reason to shed your tears. You will be as mended as the bridge the working crew have just reopened. The thick air will be vanquished with the tide. And the river that was corrupted by lies will be cleansed totally and free. And the rooster will call in the setting sun and the sun will beckon homeward, hiding behind the one tree that was not felled. That's my favorite phrase. The one tree that was not felled. I like that. So Dennis? Yes. So you have one poem. I have I have one that I think we can close it with when professor professor is ready. But what's yours? When I get to heaven, I like to think about heaven. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't I don't I don't think I have it here. It, no, it's on two two hundred four page. In this book? Yeah. Oh <laughs> we got it, prof. We got this book. <laughs> Thank goodness, you know. Yeah, okay, that's that's the that's the that's the first, uh, that's, oh, that's almost the end of the book. Yeah. I didn't take a lot of poems from this book. Okay, this and poem, I want to know why you would do all that when you get to heaven at the end. <laughs> One time I found this poem on a blog. I cried. There was this little girl who had died. I think she was 20. And her parents dedicated the poem to her and used it to start up, up. And then I read about this child who had this white girl who went went and abroad to Africa and did a lot of stuff. And then she had died. And her parents said this poem gave them hope of what will happen when they meet her and when she got in heaven, what she did. And you know, you don't know the people. So I just wrote and said, you know, your and your blog moved me, you know, and the fact that they had a blog and about their daughter who had given so much of her life at such a young age had died. And, it, and this poem was there. So, I, so that's, so that's, that, that's, I don't usually read this poem much, but I used to read it before. Why I wrote it is because of all the lies the missionaries taught our people that, and <laughs> In, in, when I was a kid on a mission, you, they couldn't pound the drum. They had not done that for, for over two, two, three decades before my time. 
During my father's time, the Pentecostal missionaries declared that all our instruments were of the devil and they were evil yeah. and were not, and every all our instruments. And then they started bringing our people to America, probably in the thick days. And then our people saw that the same guitar and piano that they use in the bar and the thing are the same ones they use in church. And that these missionaries were lying to our people. And, and so in, in today and before the long before the war, the churches removed that and started playing the drums and our instruments. And our instruments were not of the devil. And so that's why I wrote this one. I wrote this one from the inspiration of people putting our culture down. When I get to heaven, mm. when I get to heaven, I'm going to shout hallelujah all over the place. Mm. Dancing the doctor, the wai, the ballet, the rock and roll. I'll dance the break, the rap, hip hop. All the dances only sinners have danced. I will sing opera the African way. Dance the ballet the African. When I get to heaven, I'll pray so loud, shaking hands the white way, the black way, greeting with cola nuts as the gribbles do. I'll lie prostrate to greet the Yoruba way, not fingers to greet as Liberians do. There will be no boundaries, no laws, no rules. When I get to heaven, I'll sing the blues and dance the sumo. I'll paint my face with white chalk and red rock. Sit with missionaries so all can see. I'll pound my drums, shaking my sasa, blowing my trumpet the African way, dancing to Jesus the African. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, someone, so uh, you can put the link there for your books on Amazon. Somebody's asking. Go ahead. They are, they are on Amazon. They are all over. Yeah. They are on everything. They are on Amazon, yes. the America, Amazon, Canada, Amazon, UK, even in non speaking English countries. They are advertised in the language and so in, in, you know, sometimes you see you think they're cussing you. They are advertised around the world in, in Asian languages, in Dutch, in German languages. They are all over the world. So, Prof, I, 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 I don't know how to, to uh, uh, wind it down. There are too many. So we have when the wanderers come home. We have there will come to a time. We have song from Morovia. Which one do you want to to, well, to what read? Poem, what poem called When the Wanderers Come? Isn't that what it's called? Oh no, sorry, it's the book. <laughs> it's called There Will Come a Time. And, oh yeah, and I book that doesn't have that kind of title. No, where the so which one do you want to end okay, with? Let me, I got my poem I wanted to read. Okay, okay. Uh -huh. Let me read. Okay. This is what I tell my daughter. Oh. <laughs> I know that one. <laughs> okay. This okay. one was in Becoming Ebony, I think. <laughs> this is what okay. I tell my daughter. If my father hadn't scared me, I wouldn't be here. Mm. I'd be somewhere down Jala Town or Slipway, where the Nesorado dumps its junk by dark swamp. I'd be carrying buckets full of dirt to turn Morovia swamp into dry land. Or I'd be somebody's wife trying to be somebody's wife. This is how I scare my daughter. You wouldn't be here. You, she's upset. The one I really told she's upset. You'd be somewhere where babies wait in long lines to be born. Little babies with four feet waiting in the unborn world where food can't grow. I would have had 10 children before you were born. You there standing in line waiting to be born while I'd be in some overcrowded town. 
some unknown city or village with skinny legged children, mucus noses, bare feet, crying for food. I'd be there one husband each month, one room each month. On Capitol Bypass, where I grew up, all the boys knew how to get a girl pregnant. All sorts of men and boys, all sorts of people lurking at windows in doorways. Plenty of men from Nigeria, from Sudan, from faraway villages in Liberia, from Mars. This is what I tell my daughter. Yes. My father, a barbed wire fence, his needle poking eyes, scaring boys away. The boys called him CIA chief. <laughs> the girls on Capitol Bypass with their quirky brown cheeks, their smooth pretty skin, their sophisticated set. My father called them grown up girls, bringing home star trophies in teen arms. I like that. I like, I, you know, I mean, all the poems, like the other one, my insurance plan. That, that one is funny. Oh, so, that I, one is so crazy. When I used to read on radio, I would be reading it. The first time somebody in Pittsburgh had to hold her mouth, the, the producer had to hold her mouth and run out, out the studio. <laughs> She read because she didn't want to laugh. I'm like, my new insurance plan. My new insurance plan. So, Prof. Okay, Dennis, when... what Dennis want now? No, because I want you to read uh, one poem on the wall. So, let's stay in this book because we don't want to... I like that. Dennis, you don't, you, you don't want people to be sad. So, the other poem by, by Popular Demand is mm. When I Get to Heaven. Well, I read it. We just did. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Yes. Really... Yeah. Tell them they, they got to pay me if I, if I have to read. They have to read. Yeah. Let me read minority. Y'all in America, they call you minority. <laughs> I, I remember reading. I was reading. They were honoring me in Liberia, and the room was full of all Liberian, big shots and Liberians. And then there were a few white people there. So I greeted everybody and said, <laughs> I say I want to say hi to the minority. <laughs> <laughs> I say I want to say hi to you, minority. One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> let me read. Let me read minority. They, you know, I don't use the word minority. I don't use it because minority means minor, unimportant, less, little, nothing. And that's the American term for us. Black people and brown people, they call us minority. You put us together, we are not minority, we're in the majority. <laughs> minority, I wrote it very early in the 90s when we came. A minority. At home, I am a Jabe. Jabe Cho, married to Seo Pan, now a Wesley, a Tobo from Baplipo. Chidawa, you know, Yiraje, body or line, a tool from Tuwake, a wine lineage. Where the Javis have their place in the history of the Grebo people? I am Grebo. The Grebo's coming down the Grebo forest, sticking the coastline. The Grebo's of the Bolobo War, the Grebo Wars against America Liberian dominion. At whom I am not only Grebo, a Marylander of Marylanders. I have never before stumbled my way into history. I come from where the Atlantic refuses to sleep, where the forest never turns yellow, where the waters run wild cold, where the brooks sing a melody to the sea, where the Kavala rushes to greet the ocean with cola nuts and spice pepper, Maryland. Where Kipamos borrows land to the sea, stretching its arm to greet the sea. I 
I am choir of the a choir of choirs where the crews, the gravels, the crowns, the sapos, the basas, and the bellet come from a common sheep. We are a people of all peoples. Our lines run deep, deeper than the soil that meets the waters across West Africa. In Africa, I am Liberian. When I speak, I give myself away, a Liberian. I am African, West African, of Songhe, Mali, and Ghana. A huge history smeared with blood, the blood of slavery. We are king of Africa, the sons of Jacob. Having sold our kin to Egypt, we've come to meet them. Yes, they are our kin. They look like us. They even dance like us and laugh like us and cry like us. So America puts us together in America's jar, a tight jar, minority. Ah, what a word. <laughs> what a word and what a poem. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Focus on Liberia. This is the literary hour. Our discussion is with Dr. Patricia Jabba Wesley. And she's uh, joining us tonight, reading some of her poems and also talking about writing and her poetry. And I'm joined by my co-host. I call her Professor Jackie Sire, but she doesn't like <laughs> So, uh, ma'am, we have one professor here today, and that's Professor Patricia Javel Wesley. Look, uh, Dennis, we have to start finding uh, your other poem because people people keep listing poems, and Prof will yeah. be here all night if we have to. So, three more poems, and then Prof will have to. Bill. I will say the bill. No, don't worry. <laughs> so, so we have one from J J J one Moravia women. I don't know that one. Yeah, it's there. Oh. You know Moravia women? Moravia women oh, is, here. is here. Yes. Oh. I think so. Page, Everybody Dennis. knows Moravia women. Where, where were you, Jackie? Well, maybe, maybe, oh. um, maybe I can remember because I, I the one I'm, I'm reading is a poem for Mor for Moravia, but it's different. Moravia women, even the people in Michigan, still <laughs> ask me to read Moravia women where I go by like Moravia women. Okay, I wrote it. Dennis, I wrote a poem when I was teaching you. Oh, really? And, and that's that's what I, I I also want to know, uh, Dr. Wesley. 1988. Oh, wow. Yes. Yeah, 1988, I read. There was, was, let me tell you something, there was a demonstration in Morovia, or March or something. And I was coming from town. That was for Saturday, so I was not in school. And I they, there was too much traffic. We were parked on Camp Johnson Road. We couldn't get off that road. And I spent most of that time in front of Moravia College, even though I was then coming from work. And I could see people leave, you know, women get out of their big cars and leave their driver and go to the UN driver's capital bypass to, to get a cab. But I couldn't leave my car because I want my, my driver. So when I got home, they saw the point. I was watching the women in their clothes. And I was inspired to write Moravia Women from there. I got home, ran in my room, and wrote the poem. Page 195. Okay. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Moravia yeah, Women. Jackie said she's no Moravia Women. Oh my no, God. I want to listen. I, I, I don't want to read with, with you. I want to listen to it. I want okay. to listen to your reading. Moravia Women. Moravia Women, here they come. You see their colorful faces before you know their hearts. Shiny red lips, red cheeks, tinted <laughs> eyelids, and lashes. Perhaps they would like to pin their pupils too. Their eyebrows take to various roots to suit their longing hearts. Eh, hey, Moravia women, look at their look legs. At you could build a mansion from jewelry a single woman wears. Sometimes, like Indians, their noses wear gold rings, while their ears themselves wear several others too. You have yet to see their hands. Long nails painted to match the various hues their eyes and cheeks wear. Fingers held apart by heavy gold rings. 
Ooh, you should see them walking down the road. Moravia women in evening gowns and dresses, lapa suits and costly coats on their way to work. You should see them at work. They nurse and pin their nails all day and guide their skirts from poking onto a rusted nail. Moravia women strolling in the humid sun in high expensive shoes. If you will stop to ask their toes how much fun it really is walking in such heels, I'm sure you'd say, hey, yeah, for our poor Moravia women. Mar that's Moravia women. What happened to Jackie? Moravia she, women she, drove her away. She's, she's here. How, they, how about the women in my family? Since they haven't changed. The Moravia women haven't changed. And, and, and that, that's what I'm surprised that in 1988, I, I, never saw, I never saw rings in the nose or more earrings, but you said they were there. Oh, I saw a ring in the nose. Hmm. I saw a ring in the nose. And I was in high school. They had to make a law. You couldn't wear a ring in school unless you were engaged and there was a letter on fire. Because those girls used to have so many rings on their fingers. Some girls, one or two girls, not everybody. Oh. Okay. Jackie, are you okay with your... Let's read the, uh, the, the women we in can't my hear, We can't hear Jackie. You can't hear me? Oh, okay. We can hear you now. Yeah, yeah. There's um, there's there's wind, so my internet is a little bit unstable. So it switched the camera, but I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. I'm here. Okay. So Dennis, your all of this, we should we should be putting some questions. They'll be asking Prof some questions too. Do you have any to ask her? Yeah, and and our. Uh... So do, do you do you see any uh, because you started writing like this one is 1988 till now. So if you look if you look over your poem, what, what do you see? Is there like a a change? Is there anything you look back on and say, hmm, or oh, are that's you still a, that's in that same Yeah, that's a very good question. Um yes, um you can see I, when you see Tuwaken and you see Moravia women and um, when I first started writing, and um, when I was writing from my African, I still write from the African sensibility, but I was writing with the African rhythm and stuff. And I was writing very traditional poems about traditional culture, our culture. And then as I, as I wrote, Becoming Ebony became a little different. And then I play with the uh, couplets in Becoming Ebony because an American poet was studying Marie Howe, and I have a whole book of just couplet, unofficial couplets. So that book, from that book's time, I wrote a lot of couplets and, and for Becoming Ebony and, and The River is Rising. And then when I got to where the road turns, I moved away from that couplet a little bit. And so my, my poetry began to, take on more American influences and 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 even though and then in when the wanderers come home I spent five months in Liberia and I was working on a different book but during that time I wrote when the wanderers come home I didn't even know I was writing the book I just wrote poems about I was shocked that was my first cultural shock after the war because I stay in Moravia for five months. Usually I go to Moravia and say, I went to Moravia in 2008, and I went to Moravia in 2009, 10, 11, 12. But in Titan was the only time I stayed more than one month. I stayed five months. And those five months impressed themselves so much on me that I wrote a book. I wrote an, almost the entire book during the five months and i didn't know it was a book i was just writing because when you are culturally shocked so i haven't even read those poems any other one from 
when the wanderers come home because that's when I wrote um, poems about people dying and they sent me some black clothes, they're all those. And so my poetry was heavily influenced by the anger. And in that poem, you will see me talking a lot about how the termites have eaten up the land. The termites are eating up our lives. And termites literally eat things in, in, in Congo town. And my house, I left there, termites are eating doors and this and that. But the termites in the poem were the political termites. They were metaphorically referring to the politicians. So I would, that book is a little different. And then the latest book, the, the, when you look at this new book, if you look at the first section of the book, it's different. The first section of the book has returned to the, the way um, the, the way before the palms could bloom, it, it has returned to that old and uh, agreeable musical rhythm, musical style. Why? For the first time in 40 years, I went back to Kipamos by road. I didn't know the impact of the, the influence. Went back by road and, and went through the different villages, Nimba villages, Zwedru villages, went through the villages going on the rugged roads. And, and then I realized that I was impacted by the culture of the people that I would interact with. And, I, and then I went to Kipamos and went to my home village for the first time. In, that was 2016, and went to my husband's home village and interacted with the culture. And, the, and then I wrote this section of the book and found out that it was heavily influenced. So this new book, the first section, those are the new poems. I yes. just like the poems in Before the Palm Could Bloom. And I didn't know that until I began to read the poem and realize they were heavily influenced, except the poems that I wrote before I went to the Pamos. And um, but the poems, even the the the, the 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 title poem, Praise Song for My Children, was heavily influenced by that. And in fact the poem Fire and Rain and that I wrote for my father um, and is also influenced by that. And um, so that's what happened. Uh, so my poems evolve, but they go back and forth. The thing I'm hoping that I can do in another a net, a book um, is to see if I can play with tighter lines and um, uh, small poems. You know, I'm not, uh, I think I have too much inspiration to write um, more tight poems. <laughs> I used to write three, three poems that I relate and if I had too much inspiration, why I probably forgot that now. Yeah. So if you're finished, I want to read um, a poem in a new book that I think is um, that is that reminds me of what I was doing with the um, original and uh, with the uh, praise song for my with, I was doing with before the palm could bloom. Before the palm could bloom, in, let me tell the connection I'm making. In Before the Palm Could Bloom, the whole book is crying, it's wailing, the Liberian Civil War. It's angrily wailing. The war is going on. The book was written in the, the war, and then the, after I came here, for the first few years, the first literally 10 years, okay, I was crying over the war, and I was writing those poems. If you read them, you will see. And then, but this new, the new section is wailing over Liberia, over the, the ruin, over the decay of the country, over the lost villages, the empty villages, you know. I like to see three of us like this. <laughs> <laughs> Prof, my 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 camera died. My 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 expensive Amazon camera died. So we're like this, yeah. 
So, it's so, good. And so, 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 Doctor Wesley, what, what's what's on the uh, any book on the horizon? What are we? We oh, yeah, are working on the Liberian anthology. Okay. I'm working on the anthology. I mean, I have my book of my memoir that I I probably will give up trying to get an agent and just just send it mm -hmm. to a publisher. I'm the publishers want it, but I want an agent. And and I'm working on the anthology, which I'm excited about. Right. Um, is in is I have poems. I actually finished the entire, the entire anthology of poetry and prose. It was 400 and something pages. It's done. We did all the work. But then I realized that the prose in it, the short stories from the Liberian, few Liberian writers, we don't have short stories from the 1800s. We don't have much short stories from the 90s. We have one or two stories from Sankarolo. And the stories from Brown, like the applicants and other things I'm including, are not um, up to the standard of the global market. They are even, even, even the senator suit? <laughs> no, they are not up to standard. <laughs> okay. And the reason is because a lot of, even when he's describing, they, they are writing for Liberia. This time when you write, you have to write for the globe. Yeah. have to write for the globe, but you also have to, I'm thinking, somebody else could publish those. I'm not joking. If I publish them, the critics are going to beat me. Liberian people don't know how much I get affected by Nigerian scholars and other people. They write book articles, they write book chapters, they travel across the globe to deliver, to present papers on what I'm doing on Patricia Jalen Wesley and the global tradition, Patricia Jalen Wesley's poetry. So if I publish fiction that is not up to standard, they will say, what happened? First of all, publishers won't publish it. The publishers that know me will not publish it. They will throw in the trash. And then they will be throwing most of the book in the trash. Most of the book is poetry. Most of the book is almost as poetry. So I decided instead of having the book discarded, I will publish the poetry and then work on prose with the young people and develop their, help them develop their prose and see whether we can get together a good bit of prose to have an anthology of that. Mm. The, the question I was going to ask and then... Uh, I'm working you, on another book of poems. Yeah, the is, the yeah. is asking the, almost the same thing is uh, because we, earlier we spoke about and you said the Labrin mindset and how the Labrin writers are as a dental so in that so my question was what what can we do about it so uh deeply now is saying almost the same thing uh firstly i want to thank dr wesley for all she has done for library literature but especially our poetry my question is what hope does dr wesley have for our poetry to, today and what must our society do to elevate our arts but more so our literature and poetry with all this, you know, what can be done? What's the hope and what- well, That's what we're doing. What can be done, Gplay knows, is what I'm doing. I'm I'm sacrificing my money and time almost every year since COVID to go to Liberia, conduct classes for five weeks with young people and teach them the importance of writing and how to write effectively, how to write well. One of the things I'm, I'm happy about is the children have, the young people have talent. They have a lot of talent. They have time because they don't have jobs, okay? They have anger. And somebody said cre every creative writer needs an edge, needs something that makes them uncomfortable, something that irritates them that about the world that they want to fix and that must be fixed only by them. That's what writing is. If you can write and you have no edge, you have no nothing that makes you irritated, that irritates you, that angers you about the state of the world. And the state of the world could be your life, the state of your life, the state of your town that you want to put on paper. If you have that, the kids have it, the young people have it. They have a country they can't understand. They have a country that they don't see improving. They have a country in which they are a few disadvantaged, where they have no hope after college, where they don't have good colleges. So they are angry, they have it. And many of them have they need a talent to 
You can have all the anger. If you don't have talent to write, you're not going to write. You'll go to jail with your anger. <laughs> so they have the, if you if they have the talent. So that's hope. When the anthology of poetry comes out and you see people like Ayobi, Ayoba, and you see poets like Olu Besman, and you see young poets like Janetta Kone, you see young poets like G1 Akoi. You see my young girls who graduated today, this reading is dedicated to them. Eh? And, 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 and Kula Washington eh? and, and, and Lopu Vesely. You see writing by Eduardo de Bosco. When you see those kids works in that anthology, you will have hope. I read them. I critiqued them. I, I edited them. I went back and forth with them. Take this out. This doesn't look good. How will you put it? Will you do this? Can you do this to make it better? This poem is not, not strong if you keep this line. I did that with those children. We have 70 pages of young Liberian talent between the ages of 20 and 30. That is hope. That is hope. Even if we get five of them become Liberian poets, we're gone. Hmm. Jackie, you are um, muted. Unmute yourself, Jackie. Um, the prof is right because I I just became friends with Eduardo and I started to read some of his poetry and it's amazing. Amazing. Yeah. So yeah. we have hope. We we don't need we don't need a poet. We need poets. We don't need one poet. And I already got a commitment from a publisher that if I can get the book to 200 pages, he will publish it and he will distribute it through Africa. We are, and that would be the that would be one of the first anthology, except the Kenyans who always do anthology of Kenyan poetry. You know, they've been doing it for ages, but they have the East African publishing yeah. and the Kenyans are dynamic. They have all kinds of publishing, okay? But that would be amazing. I told them, then the publisher said, oh, and the publishing one of the young librarian kids, Jeremy Khan, and he said, oh, Jeremy Khan is good. I said, we have a dozen Jeremy Khan in Liberia, but you don't know them. If you publish this book, you will get to know them. And maybe you can publish their works too. I said, we have Ayoba. We have Olu Best. And we have our young people. They need to be published widely. So I'm not doing it for me. I can, if I wrote a book of poems today, it will be published. It will publish. I will ask for it. Uh, you couldn't ask me how I get my books published. I have never. The only book I submitted to be published was Becoming Ebony. Becoming Ebony was my dissertation. I sent it out November of 2000, of November of 2001, to the Crab Ultra Award Series. I sent one copy out, pay my late money, and sent it. Eh? And it won the Crab Ultra Award. And it got published. That's the only book I sent out. All the other books were solicited. Were solicited. I don't finish the book, it gets solicited. Do you have poems? I had when the wanderers come home, when I came from Africa, Kwame does send me an email and say, Patricia, send me some poems, I will publish your book. I say, I don't have a book yet, I'm still working on it. He said, get out of here. Anytime I know you sitting on a book, you sitting on a book somewhere. I say, I don't think so. He said, look, I started putting my poems together. It was a book. I sent it to him. He said, I told you you were sitting on a book. You always sitting on a book. So, so yeah, I'm not worried about me. I'm thinking about my children. I'm thinking we can get a woman poet. The kids are publishing. Some of them self-publishing. I encourage them not to self-publish. Yeah. Self-publishing is the graveyard of a poet. Yeah. Some librarians don't agree with me. If you self-publish, the thing you self-publish is considered public. So you can't take your poems again, put it in another book, and send it to a book publisher. And then they, they already define that first impression. You are editing your own book. It's like a doctor doing surgery on himself, diagnose himself, 
and say he's doing heart surgery on himself. You ever see a doctor do heart surgery on himself? <laughs> no. Okay. Well, <laughs> I think we're going to end this thing. Are you going to bring me <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we 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 are about to to wind down. We've gone out uh, because left with us, we we'll keep going. But let's uh, two and a half hours, and we're still talking, yeah. and we haven't. But well, prof, you have to Where come back. You have to, you you have yeah. to come back, and 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 for those of you who are listening, um, uh, uh if Jenny will allow me, uh, Prof Wesley will be speaking at Cornell next week. She will be the 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 the, the uh, um. The, the uh, uh, Institute for African Development poet for the Migration Initiative, and it will be co-sponsored by the International Center and now the uh, Center for International Studies. And um, Ithaca is also the city of asylum for young scholars from around the world, writers who have fled yeah, persecution. Yeah, 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 so, they, so they will be. <laughs> so they will be. They will be co-sponsoring it, and I will send the link out so you guys can listen to her. The theme is migration, exile, homecoming, loss. So please join us. And Prof, we don't know how to th thank you. We could have stayed here, and please come I, back. I got one poem to close with. Well, you got to let Oh no, we're not closing without a poem. I'm just saying thank you to you. You know, thank you so much for 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 for. We know how busy you are, especially for March, which is a uh, poetry month. Oh we yeah, that I, you and then I it. have a. I have another, I have two, three events, two events other than and the Cornell. I have, if you missed this, uh, if you want to see again, you got to register for these. Cornell, you have to register. You got to let them know yeah, that. Yeah, I'll, I'll put okay. the link up. Yeah, okay. And on the 23rd, I have a presentation for Penn State Alumni Association, the Greater Penn State Alumni Association. They want me to come talk about the same and they want me to talk about everything and my joining, my personal scholarly joining to this point, okay? So I will be doing a little bit of reading, a little bit of talking, and then we'll do question and answer. And, and they usually do a good job. They have big pens, they their alumni station, invited me to be their virtual speaker and for their virtual speaker spirits. And on the 31st, I have something else with uh, Elizabeth Town University. I don't know. I forgot the title, but it's all these these are already been advertised since February. Yeah. Yes. And so we'll, we'll yeah. So, yeah. So yeah. So so read the poem, uh, uh, Prof. Let's let's we can we but can let you go. Without. If you bring me again, I don't want to talk about my poetry. <coughs> I want to talk. I want to do. Um, a Zoom, uh, your, I can use the literary hour to do writing workshop. We do a writing workshop Dennis? right on this show. We have to write, <laughs> write yeah. on and submit them, and then we critique them right here. And then we can yeah, okay. pick up maybe five, six people to be live with me. So we do a workshop so students watching will know how to critique their own poems. I always tell young people that <coughs> my throat getting dry. I always tell young people that if you neglect writing workshops after you graduate and go into life, you will not find anybody who will waste their time editing your work. So you need to that, that would be wonderful. We look forward to that. Yeah, that's what we do. We get yeah. five, six people submit their work, get approval. And then they will be on and quick. So we'll show them how they quickly one another. And then the other people can be in the background asking right. questions and learning. But so if you are listening to us, please uh, get to know, get prepared, and uh, we will <coughs> get you the date and time for this writing workshop with Dr. Wesley. Let's go, Prof. You can read your, your last. Uh, yeah, let me read my last. Point, and we're going to be closing for the night. Yeah, let me Which read is my last. When is it? Which one is it? Because I'm running out of gas. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, this poem, I want to read it because it's similar to the poems in the first, the book goes back. It goes from newest to oldest. And so it's like, it reminds me of 
Charles told the uh, all any of the other ones, but it's a little lighter tune. We know that Dennis one only good thing is an American now. You know, Americans are still like, why are your poems so depressing? <laughs> I'm like, sorry, baby, <laughs> but that's it too. Okay, let me read pray song for my children. Yes. Yes. I want to dedicate to all my children who are graduating all around the world, to all the young Liberians, to my own children. The book is dedicated to dozens of people. The names, you saw the names, Jackie? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. First song for my children. Let me be your mommy water, your river G, crossing you into old gravel country. After the hills gave way, after the truck slides through mud and rocks, through dangerous muddy ditches along Zwedru's lost forest, in search of our father's homeland. Let me be your mama, Africa, your mama that grew out of old streams of old rivers from Kerebo to Karoken, all the way to Tuwaken, where after so long, only small roosters remain in a town that used to be ours. Let me come to you at dawn, my children. My calabash wet from the early dawn's water fetching run. My lapa wet from the brush, from the cry of old pepper birds, the owls howling, from the old footpath lost to the wanderers feet. Let me come to you bearing tears on my face after the war, after the villages have crumbled under the weight of grave hate. Let me be your landfill, your garbage dump, the one only who could carry you in her young supple womb, carrying you with my youth, carrying you even though Liberia was losing herself. And from afar, we could see the oncoming smoke of war. Let me come to you bearing palm branches that wither too quickly in the heat of March. Here, take from my hands and drink my child. One by one, take and drink. After the afterbirth, have hushed her in the soil where we did not bury them. After our feet have become parched from running, after our way back home has been burned by war, let me be your mommy water, your mama rising out of the wild ocean high. Let me be your consolation that the land I gave to you is dying. I am becoming an old woman now, my son. I am becoming my mother and her mother's mother. I am becoming the ghost of my mother. I am becoming Ayi bow-legged. I am becoming fire and rain. I am becoming Debo. I am becoming the water bearer. I am becoming the palapai that was not shattered in the shattering. Let me sing to you, my daughter, you who have never known where we come from. You who will never know your mother's tongue. You who have become the metaphor of lost warriors who were captured by war. Let me be your songwriter, the song you sing, the dirge you do not know how to sing. Let me wrap around you my lapa that has been lost in the storm. Let me lay down all my lapas for you to walk on, my blood soil lapas from the war. Let me come to you, my daughters, when the sun becomes yellow and then red, when it seems the sun is falling down upon us. Let me come to you carrying the moon in my warm palms. Let me be your mommy water your one mama rising out of the waves of war. Let me be your role map. Um, let us walk together 
home world where the ocean roars in peace and in war, the rising tides along Liberia's coast. Let me be your tears. Let me be the mess of rattle. When I rise at dawn, my children, I long for you, but I long for home more. I long for a lost country that I speak to know again. When I rise, my sons, I long for the sound of the drum that used to sit at Duakai. I long for cassava shoots and for the banana tree to bloom again. I long for me. I long for the girl that was lost. I long to find my feet again, to find my feet again, to find my feet again. I long for me. Let me come to you carrying hope in my hands. Let me come to you carrying hope in my hands. Let me come to you, my daughters, carrying hope in my hands. Wow. We could stay here all night, but as they no, say, No, it's time to go. Um, yeah, it's time to go. Yagi? Yeah. Thank you, Prof. You, you've, you've brought hope in your hands, and we don't know how to thank you. We are, we are just so blessed to have you as one of Liberia's own, and we thank you, and we, 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 um, yeah. And we pray that one day you will write the the ode to Liberia, you know, the ode to her rising, you know, taking her rightful place in the world, you know, and then all of these things, the new book will be called The Upliftment, The Reformation, <laughs> The Restoration of Liberia. We thank you so much, Prof, and we hope that you will come back again and join us to talk again, not only about the workshop, but also about poetry and, 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 and the, the upliftment of the human soul through the poetry. We thank you very, very much. And as for me, I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones because I get to see you next Friday <laughs> again. And, you know, but thank you so much. And definitely, if you, if you post the things about um, the event at Penn State, we will definitely tune in. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I just, you. yeah, thank you, you so much. You guys are my pride. You know, it's both ways. You guys are my pride, you know? And yeah. when I was teaching Moravia College, all those young people, I was young, I was 30 something, and I was teaching these young people and, and I was so bossy and everything. And I was shocked yeah, because high school wasn't for me. It was Moravia <laughs> College that taught me that high school wasn't for me. The kids were good. But I, like Mrs. <laughs> young used to say, eh, me Wesley, you, oh, one day I just, I said I resign. I resign. You say, <laughs> hey, Wesley, no, you you can't resign. People don't just get angry one day in class and resign. You can't resign, baby girl. You can't resign. <laughs> so, but anyway, and then Jackie, them were my uh, college students. Uh, yeah, your class was eight o'clock in the morning, so I had to be looking for chair, putting chair on my head to come to your class in TH. And I, and yeah, and that time was, those days were interesting. And I will close on this joke. One day in my early years, I went to class. It was the first day of class. And you know that University of Liberia, all these guys and things. So I went to class and I'm standing in front of the class with my file, you know, and I'm just walking up and down in front of the class. And the class getting full and full. And the class used to be, my class used to be overfilled, you know, to that city or so. So I, the boys were saying, oh, you better go find your seat. <laughs> you better go find your seat. You better get seat, though. Then uh, what other one? Then look at her. She waiting then when the class go. Then we the boys, then we have to give her seat. Then we say, get standing up. You better go find your seat and move from in front of the teacher there. You better go find your seat. So they kept talking. And I'm like, you know, I was so thin. I was in the early 80s, you know, like 81, 82, 83. And I look like 16 year old anyway. So after they got tired talking, I'm in my twenties. I just went and started writing on the board. Patricia Jabe Wesley. Oh, that is teacher. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
So I think that oh, I think I don't know. Oh, everybody, everybody. You know, <laughs> we have fun those days, Jackie. And you, all... I know exactly. It was TH50. It was <laughs> TH50. That was my 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 my. You remember my the class. room? <laughs> yeah. Yes, and and do. I had a I had a real culture. People got married when they left my class. Many couples. Got yeah, and and. They, I remember you were talking about nocturnal being. There was a guy in the class and he got angry because he was a grave digger. And, he, and we were laughing because we used to call, we started calling him nocturnal being. <laughs> he didn't like it at all. So those were the days. But thank you, bro. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I have fun. It was a good conversation. Yes, yeah. thank you so much, bro. Yeah, thank you. And then tomorrow I'm going to watch it again and listen to the poetry again. <laughs> Oh, well, you said I don't listen to my own nonsense. I'm no, no, no. For us, we have to listen again. After, yes, we want to they interview me at the last time, I don't ever watch it. It can be NPR or anything. You will yeah. never see me watch it. Because if I may want me to be correcting myself, why did I say that? No, I don't watch it. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Thank yeah, you very thank much. You. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, Thank you so yeah. much, yeah. Well, you guys. That you're okay. on your side now. When you're ready. You can go. I will, I will ask you some of the comments. Yeah, what? Yeah. Oh, when you're finished, I will see it. Come yeah, hi, J1. Hi, G1. Hi. Oh, look at my brother. Hey, yeah. Uh, yeah, those are the people I was supposed to go work with and the COVID. Yeah. So, those no, are the comments. You. And, you will, and you will read more on, on Facebook. Uh, we want to thank you so much. Um, Professor Wesley for being here tonight. I want to thank all our viewers and those who will even watch later on on YouTube and other social media platform. Tomorrow, we're going to have more. Keep your dial set here at Focus on Liberia, where we educate, we elevate, and promote everything pertaining to Liberia. Tomorrow, quickly, uh, 3 p.m., we're going to have you know, this one is uh, right now we are on the radio in Monrovia. So you can watch Focus on Liberia every Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday on Hat FM 107.9. This uh, Sunday at 6, we are debuting a new show, This I Remember. This I Remember is a journey of nostalgia, remembering, and reclaiming. You don't want to miss it. Thank you so That's much. Enough. Yeah, That's don't forget if you, want, if you want if you want to, 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 to read more poems, go and buy the book. Go and, and, and buy Professor Jabber Wesley's books so you can read it. It's on Amazon. Don't forget. Right. Yeah. And for the new one, you can get the used one, but buy them. <laughs> and, and and the easy way to get them, if at least if you get this one or uh, the praise song for my children, they are from the selected. At least you get a piece of everything in there to start with. That's a mm -hmm. good place to start. Yeah. But I want to thank you all for, for watching. We never close our broadcast without playing the song that says, We are all Liberian. We're going to close with that song. Good night and God bless you. We are Liberian. Yeah.